Author's English Preface The following little piece was written in the winter of 1795 and 96, and, as I had not determined whether to publish it during the present war, or to wait till the commencement of a piece, it has lain by me without alteration or addition from the time it was written. What has determined me to publish it now is a sermon preached by Watson, Bishop of Landiff. Some of my readers will recollect that this bishop wrote a book entitled An Apology for the Bible in answer to my second part of the Age of Reason. I procured a copy of his book, and he may depend upon hearing from me on that subject. At the end of the bishop's book is a list of the works he has written, among which is the sermon alluded to. It is entitled, The Wisdom and Goodness of God in Having Made Both Rich and Poor, with an appendix containing reflections on the present state of England and France. The error contained in this sermon determined me to publish my agrarian justice. It is wrong to say God made rich and poor. He made only male and female, and he gave them the earth for their inheritance. Instead of preaching to encourage one part of mankind in insolence, it would be better that priests employed their time to render the general condition of man less miserable than it is. Practical religion consists in doing good, and the only way of serving God is that of endeavoring to make his creation happy. All preaching that has not this for its object is nonsense and hypocrisy. Thomas Paine Agrarian Justice To preserve the benefits of what is called civilized life, and to remedy at the same time the evil which it has produced, ought to be considered as one of the first objects of reformed legislation. Whether that state that is proudly, perhaps erroneously, called civilization has most promoted or most injured the general happiness of man is a question that may be strongly contested. On one side the spectator is dazzled by splendid appearances, on the other he is shocked by extremes of wretchedness both of which it has erected. The most affluent and the most miserable of the human race are to be found in the countries that are called civilized. To understand what the state of society ought to be, it is necessary to have some idea of the natural and primitive state of man, such as it is at this day among the Indians of North America. There is not in that state any of those spectacles of human misery which poverty and want present to our eyes in all the towns and streets in Europe. Poverty, therefore, is a thing created by that which is called civilized life. It exists not in the natural state. On the other hand, the natural state is without those advantages which flow from agriculture, arts, science, and manufacturers. The life of an Indian is a continual holiday, compared with the poor of Europe, and on the other hand, it appears to be abject when compared to the rich. Civilization, therefore, or that which is so called, has operated two ways to make one part of society more affluent and the other more wretched than would have been the lot of either in a natural state. It is always possible to go from the natural to the civilized state, but it is never possible to go from the civilized to the natural state. The reason is that man in a natural state, subsisting by hunting, requires ten times the quantity of land to range over, to procure himself sustenance, than would support him in a civilized state, where the earth is cultivated. When therefore a country becomes populous by the additional aids of cultivation, art, and science, there is a necessity of preserving things in that state, because without it there cannot be sustenance for more, perhaps than a tenth part of its inhabitants. The thing therefore now to be done is to remedy the evils and preserve the benefits that have arisen to society by passing from the natural to that which is called the civilized state. In taking the matter upon this ground, the first principle of civilization 
ought to have been, and ought still to be, that the condition of every person born into the world after a state of civilization commences ought not to be worse than if he had been born before that period. But the fact is that the condition of millions in every country in Europe is far worse than if they had been born before civilization began or had been born among the Indians of North America at the present day. I will shew how this effect has happened. It is a position not to be controverted that the earth in its natural uncultivated state was and ever would have continued to be the common property of the human race. In that state every man would have been born to property. He would have been a joint life proprietor with the rest in the property of the soil and in all its natural productions, vegetable and animal. But the earth in its natural state, as before said, is capable of supporting but a small number of inhabitants compared with what it is capable of doing in a cultivated state. And as it is impossible to separate the improvement made by cultivation from the earth itself, upon which that improvement is made, the idea of landed property arose from that inseparable connection. But it is nevertheless true that it is the value of the improvement only, and not the earth itself, that is individual property. Every proprietor, therefore, of cultivated land owes to the community a ground rent, for I know of no better term to express the idea for the land which he holds, and it is from this ground rent that the fund proposed in this plan is to issue. It is deducible as well from the nature of the thing as from all the histories transmitted to us, that the idea of landed property commenced with cultivation, and that there was no such thing as landed property before that time. It could not exist in the first state of man, that of hunters, it did not exist in the second state, that of shepherds, neither Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, nor Job, so far as the history of the Bible may be credited in probable things, were owners of land. Their property consisted, as is always enumerated, in flocks and herds, and they traveled with them from place to place. The frequent contentions at that time about the use of a well in the dry country of Arabia, where those people lived, also shew that there was no landed property. It was not admitted that land could be claimed as property. There could be no such thing as landed property originally. Man did not make the earth, and though he has had a natural right to occupy it, he had no right to locate as his property in perpetuity any part of it. Neither did the creator of the earth open a land office from whence the first title deeds should issue. Whence then arose the idea of landed property? I answer as before, that when cultivation began, the idea of landed property began with it, from the impossibility of separating the improvement made by cultivation from the earth itself, upon which that improvement was made. The value of the improvement so far exceeded the value of the natural earth at that time as to absorb it, till in the end the common right of all became confounded into the cultivated right of the individual. But there are nevertheless distinct species of rights, and will continue to be so long as the earth endures. It is only by tracing things to their origin that we can gain rightful ideas of them. And it is by gaining such ideas that we discover the boundary that divides right from wrong and teaches every man to know his own. I have entitled this tract Agrarian Justice to distinguish it from Agrarian Law. Nothing could be more unjust than Agrarian Law in a country improved by cultivation. For though every man, as an inhabitant of the earth, is a joint proprietor of it in his natural state, it does not follow that he is a joint proprietor of cultivated earth. The additional value made by cultivation after the system was admitted became the property of those who did it, or who inherited it from them, or who purchased it. It had originally no owner, 
Whilst therefore I advocate the right and interest myself in the hard case of all those who have been thrown out of their natural inheritance by the introduction of the system of landed property, I equally defend the right of the possessor to the part which is his. Cultivation is at least one of the greatest natural improvements ever made by human invention. It has given to created earth a tenfold value. But the landed monopoly that began with it has produced the greatest evil. It has dispossessed more than half the inhabitants of every nation of their natural inheritance, without providing for them, as ought to have been done, an indemnification for that loss, and has thereby created a species of poverty and wretchedness that did not exist before. In advocating the case of the persons thus dispossessed, it is a right and not a charity that I am pleading for. But it is that kind of right which being neglected at first could not be brought forward afterwards till heaven had opened the way by a revolution in the system of government. Let us then do honor to revolutions by justice and give currency to their principles by blessings. Having thus in a few words opened the merits of the case, I shall now proceed to the plan I have to propose, which is to create a national fund out of which there shall be paid to every person when arrived at the age of 21 years the sum of 15 pounds sterling as a compensation in part for the loss of his or her natural inheritance by the introduction of the system of landed property, and also the sum of 10 pounds per annum during life to every person now living of the age of 50 years and to all others as they shall arrive at that age. I have already established the principle, namely that the earth in its natural uncultivated state was and ever would have continued to be the common property of the human race. That in that state every person would have been born to property and that the system of landed property by its inseparable connection with cultivation and with what is called civilized life has absorbed the property of all those whom it dispossessed without providing as ought to have been done an indemnification for that loss the fault however is not in the present possessors no complaint is intended or ought to be alleged against them unless they adopt the crime by opposing justice the fault is in the system and it has stolen imperceptibly upon the world, aided afterwards by the agrarian law of the sword. But the fault can be made to reform itself by successive generations, and without diminishing or deranging the property of any of the present possessors. The operation of the fund can yet commence and be in full activity the first year of its establishment, or soon after, as I shall shew. It is proposed that the payments, as already stated, be made to every person, rich or poor. It is best to make it so, to prevent invidious distinctions. It is also right it should be so, because it is in lieu of the natural inheritance, which as a right belongs to every man over and above the property he may have created or inherited from those who did. Such persons as do not choose to receive it can throw it into the common fund. Taking it then for granted that no person ought to be in a worse condition when born under what is called a state of civilization than he would have been had he been born in a state of nature, and that civilization ought to have made, and ought still to make, provision for that purpose, it can only be done by subtracting from property a portion equal in value to the natural inheritance it has absorbed. Various methods may be proposed for this purpose, but that which appears to be the best, not only because it will operate without deranging any present possessors, or without interfering with the collection of taxes or imprints necessary for the purposes of government and the revolution, but because it will be the least troublesome and the most effectual, and also because the subtraction will be made at a time that best admits it, is at the moment that property is passing by the death of one person to the possession of another. 
In this case, the bequeather gives nothing. The receiver pays nothing. The only matter to him is that the monopoly of natural inheritance, to which there never was a right, begins to cease in his person. A generous man would not wish it to continue, and a just man will rejoice to see it abolished. My state of health prevents my making sufficient inquiries with respect to the doctrine of probabilities, whereon to found calculations with such degrees of uncertainty as they are capable of. What therefore I offer on this head is more the result of observation and reflection than of received information, but I believe it will be found to agree sufficiently with fact. In the first place, taking 21 years as the epoch of maturity, all the property of a nation, real and personal, is always in the possession of persons above that age. It is then necessary to know, as a datum of calculation, the average of years which persons above that age will live. I take this average to be about 30 years. For though many persons will live 40, 50, or 60 years after the age of 21 years, others will die much sooner, and some in every year of that time. Taking then 30 years as the average of time, it will give, without any material variation one way or other, the average of time in which the whole property or capital of a nation, or a sum equal thereto, will have passed through one entire revolution and descent, that is, will have gone by deaths to new possessors, for though in many instances some parts of this capital will remain forty, fifty, or sixty years in the possession of one person, other parts will have revolved two or three times before those thirty years expire, which will bring it to that average. For were one half the capital of a nation to revolve twice in thirty years, it would produce the same fund as if the whole revolved once. Taking then thirty years as the average of time in which the whole capital of a nation, or a sum equal thereto, will revolve once, the thirtieth part thereof will be the sum that will revolve every year. That is, will go by deaths to new possessors, and this last sum being thus known, and the ratio percent to be subtracted from it determined, it will give the annual, the annual amount or income of the proposed fund to be applied as already mentioned. In looking over the discourse of the English minister Pitt in his opening of what is called in England the budget, the scheme of finance for the year 1796, I find an estimate of the national capital of that country. As this estimate of a national capital is prepared ready to my hand, I take it as a datum to act upon. When a calculation is made upon the known capital of any nation, combined with its population, it will serve as a scale for any other nation in proportion as its capital and population be more or less. I am the more disposed to take this estimate of Mr. Pitt for the purpose of showing to that minister, upon his own calculation, how much better money may be employed than in wasting it, as he has done on the wild project of setting up Bourbon kings. What in the name of heaven are Bourbon kings to the people of England? It is better that the people have bread. Mr. Pitt states the national capital of England real and personal, to be 1,300 million sterling, which is about one-fourth part of the national capital of France, including Belgium. The event of the last harvest in each country proves that the soil of France is more productive than that of England, and that it can better support 24 or 25 millions of inhabitants than that of England can 7 or 7.5 millions. The 30th part of this capital, of 1.3 billion pounds, is 43,333,333 pounds, which is the part that will revolve every year by deaths in that country to new possessors, and the sum that will annually revolve in France in the proportion of 4 to 1 will be about 173 million sterling. From this sum of 43,333,333 pounds annually revolving, is to be subtracted the value of the natural inheritance absorbed in it, which perhaps in fair justice cannot be taken at less, and ought not to be taken for more than a tenth part. It will always happen that of the property thus revolving by deaths every year a part will descend in a direct line to sons and daughters, 
and the other part collaterally, and the proportion will be found to be about 3 to 1. It is about 30 millions of the above sum will descend to direct heirs, and the remaining sum of 13.33 million to more distant relations and in part to strangers. Considering then that man is always related to society, that relationship will become comparatively greater in proportion as the next of kin is more distant. It is therefore consistent with civilization to say that there are no direct heirs, society shall be heir to a part over and above the tenth part due to society. If this additional part be from five to ten or twelve percent, in proportion as the next of kin be nearer or more remote, so as to average with the sheets that may fall, which ought always to go to society and not to the government, in addition of 10% more, the produce from the annual sum of 43.33 million pounds will be from 30 million pounds at 10%, 3 million pounds, from 13.33 million pounds at 10%, with the addition of 10% more, 2.66 million pounds, from 33.33 million, 5.66 million pounds. Having thus arrived at the annual amount of the proposed fund, I come in the next place to speak of the population proportion to this fund, to compare it with the uses to which the fund is to be applied. The population, I mean that of England, does not exceed seven millions and a half, and the number of persons above the age of 50 will in that case be about 400,000. There would not, however, be more than that number that would accept the proposed ten pounds sterling per annum, though they would be entitled to it. I have no idea it would be accepted by many persons who had a yearly income of two or three hundred pounds sterling, but as we often see instances of rich people falling into sudden poverty, even at the age of sixty, they would always have the right of drawing all the arrears due to them. Four millions, therefore, of the above annual sum of 5.66 million pounds will be required for 400,000 aged persons at 10 pounds sterling each. I come now to speak of the persons arriving annually at 21 years of age. If all the persons who died were above the age of 21 years, the number of persons annually arriving at that age must be equal to the annual number of deaths to keep the population stationary. But the greater part die under the age of 21, and therefore the number of persons annually arriving at 21 will be less than half the number of deaths. The whole number of deaths upon a population of 7 millions and a half will be about 220,000 annually. The number arriving at 21 years of age will be about 100,000. The whole number of these will not receive the proposed 15 pounds, for the reasons already mentioned though as in the former case they would be entitled to it. Admitting then that a tenth part declined receiving it, the amount would thus fund annually to 400,000 age at persons 10 pounds each, 4 million pounds, to 90,000 persons of 21 years, 15 pounds sterling each, 1.35 million pounds. There are in every country a number of blind and lame persons totally incapable of earning a livelihood. But as it will always happen that the greater number of blind persons will be among those who are above the age of 50 years, they will be provided for in that class. The remaining sum of 316,666 pounds will provide for the lame and blind under that age at the same rate of 10 pounds annually for each person. Having now gone through all the necessary calculations and stated the particulars of the plan, I shall conclude with some observations. It is not charity, but a right, not bounty, but justice, that I am pleading for. The present state of civilization is as odious as it is unjust. It is absolutely the opposite of what it should be, and it is necessary that a revolution should be made in it. The contrast of affluence and wretchedness continually meeting and offending the eye is like dead and living bodies chained together. Though I care as little about riches as any man, I am a friend to riches because they are capable of good. I care not how affluent some may be, provided that none be miserable in consequence of it. But it is impossible to enjoy affluence with the felicity it is capable of being enjoyed, 
while so much misery is mingled in the scene. The sight of the misery and the unpleasant sensations it suggests, which though they may be suffocated cannot be extinguished, are a greater drawback upon the felicity of affluence than the proposed 10% upon property is worth. He that would not give the one to get rid of the other has no charity, even for himself. There are in every country some magnificent charities established by individuals. It is, however, but little that any individual can do when the whole extent of the misery to be relieved is considered. He may satisfy his conscience, but not his heart. He may give all that he has, and that all will relieve but little. It is only by organizing civilization upon such principles as to act like a system of pulleys that the whole weight of misery can be removed. The plan here proposed will reach the whole. It will immediately relieve and take out of view three classes of wretchedness, the blind, the lame, and the aged poor. And it will furnish the rising generation with means to prevent their becoming poor, and will do this without deranging or interfering with any national measures. To shew that this will be the case, it is sufficient to observe that the operation and effect of the plan will in all cases be the same as if every individual were voluntarily to make his will and dispose of his property in the manner here proposed. But it is justice and not charity that is the principle of the plan. In all great cases, it is necessary to have a principle more universally active than charity, and with respect to justice, it ought not to be left to the choice of detached individuals, whether they will do justice or not. Considering then the plan on the ground of justice, it ought to be the act of the whole growing spontaneously out of the principles of the revolution and the reputation of it ought to be national and not individual. A plan upon this principle would benefit the revolution by the energy that springs from the consciousness of justice. It would multiply also the national resources, for property, like vegetation, increases by offsets. When a young couple begin the world, the difference is exceedingly great whether they begin with nothing or with 15 pounds apiece. With this aid, they could buy a cow and implements to cultivate a few acres of land, and instead of becoming burdens upon society, which is always the case where children are produced faster than they can be fed, would be put in the way of becoming useful and profitable citizens. The national domains also would sell the better if pecuniary aids were provided to cultivate them in small lots. It is the practice of what has unjustly obtained the name of civilization, and the practice merits not to be called either charity or policy, to make some provision for persons becoming poor and wretched only at the time they become so. Would it not, even as a matter of economy, be far better to adopt means to prevent their becoming poor? This can best be done by making every person, when arrived at the age of 21 years, an inheritor of something to begin with. The rugged face of society, checkered with the extremes of affluence and want, proves that some extraordinary violence has been committed upon it, and calls on justice for redress. The great mass of the poor in all countries are become an hereditary race and it is next to impossible for them to get out of that state of themselves. It ought also to be observed that this mass increases in all countries that are called civilized. More persons fall annually into it than get out of it. Though in a plan of which justice and humanity are the foundation principles, interest ought not to be admitted into the calculation. Yet it is always of advantage to the establishment of any plan to shew that it is beneficial as a matter of interest. The success of any proposed plan submitted to public consideration must finally depend on the numbers interested in supporting it, united with the justice of its principles. The plan here proposed will benefit all, without injuring any. 
It will consolidate the interest of the republic with that of the individual. To the numerous class dispossessed of their natural inheritance by the system of landed property, it will be an act of national justice. To persons dying possessed of moderate fortunes, it will operate as a tontine to their children, more beneficial than the sum of money paid into the fund, and it will give to the accumulation of riches a degree of security that none of the old governments of Europe, now tottering on their foundations, can give. I do not suppose that more than one family in ten in any of the countries of Europe has, when the head of the family dies, a clear property left of 500 pounds sterling. To all such the plan is advantageous. That property would pay 50 pounds into the fund, and if there were only two children under age, they would receive 15 pounds each, 30 pounds on coming of age, and be entitled to 10 pounds a year after 50. It is from the overgrown acquisition of property that the fund will support itself. And I know that the possessors of such property in England, though they would eventually be benefited by the protection of nine-tenths of it, will exclaim against the plan. But without entering into any inquiry how they came by the property, let them recollect that they have been the advocates of this war, and that Mr. Pitt has already laid on more new taxes to be raised annually upon the people of England, and that for supporting the despotism of Austria and the Bourbons against the liberties of France, then would pay annually all the sums proposed in this plan. I have made the calculation stated in this plan upon what is called personal, as well as upon landed property. The reason for making it upon land is already explained, and the reason for taking personal property into the calculation is equally well founded, though on a different principle. Land, as before said, is the free gift of the creator in common to the human race. Personal property is the effect of society, and it is as impossible for an individual to acquire personal property without the aid of society as it is for him to make land originally. Separate an individual from society and give him an island or a continent to possess, and he cannot acquire personal property. He cannot be rich. So inseparably are the means connected with the end in all cases that where the former do not exist, the latter cannot be obtained. All accumulation, therefore, of personal property beyond what a man's own hands produced is derived to him by living in society. And he owes on every principle of justice, of gratitude, and of civilization a part of that accumulation back again to society from whence the whole came. This is putting the matter on a general principle, and perhaps it is best to do so. For if we examine the case minutely, it will be found that the accumulation of personal property is in many instances the effect of paying too little for the labor that produced it, the consequence of which is that the working hand perishes in old age, and the employer abounds in affluence. It is perhaps impossible to proportion exactly the price of labor to the profits it produces. And it will also be said, as an apology for the injustice, that were a workman to receive an increase of wages daily, he would not save it against old age, nor be much better for it in the interim. Make then society the treasure to guard it for him in a common fund, for it is no reason that because he might not make a good use of it for himself, another should take it. The state of civilization that has prevailed throughout Europe is as unjust in its principle as it is horrid in its effects, and it is the consciousness of this, and the apprehension that such a state cannot continue when once investigation begins in any country, that makes the possessors of property dread every idea of a revolution. It is the hazard and not the principle of revolutions that retards their progress. This being the case, it is necessary as well for the protection of property, as for the sake of justice and humanity, to form a system that whilst it preserves one part of society from wretchedness, shall secure the other from depredation. 
The superstitious awe, the enslaving reverence that formerly surrounded affluence, is passing away in all countries and leaving the possessor of property to the convulsion of accidents. When wealth and splendor, instead of fascinating the multitude, excite emotions of disgust, when instead of drawing forth admiration, it is beheld as an insult upon wretchedness, when the ostentatious appearance it make serves to call the right of it in question, the case of property becomes critical, and it is only in a system of justice that the possessor can contemplate security. To remove the danger, it is necessary to remove the antipathies, and this can only be done by making property productive of a national blessing, extending to every individual. When the riches of one man above another shall increase the national fund in the same proportion, when it shall be seen that the prosperity of that fund depends on the prosperity of individuals, when the more riches a man acquires, the better it shall be for the general mass, it is then that antipathies will cease and property be placed on the permanent basis of national interest and protection. I have no property in France to become subject to the plan I propose. What I have, which is not much, is in the United States of America. But I will pay 100 pounds sterling towards this fund in France, the instant it shall be established, and I will pay the same sum in England whenever a similar establishment shall take place in that country. A revolution in the state of civilization is the necessary companion of revolutions in the system of government. If a revolution in any country be from bad to good or from good to bad, the state of what is called civilization in that country must be made conformable thereto to give that revolution effect. Despotic government supports itself by abject civilization, in which debasement of the human mind and wretchedness in the mass of the people are the chief criterions. Such governments consider man merely as an animal, that the exercise of intellectual faculty is not his privilege, that he has nothing to do with the laws but to obey them, and they politically depend more upon breaking the spirit of the people by poverty than they fear enraging it by desperation. It is a revolution in the state of civilization that will give perfection to the revolution of France. Already the conviction that government by representation is the true system of government is spreading itself fast in the world. The reasonableness of it can be seen by all. The justness of it makes itself felt even by its opposers. But when a system of civilization growing out of that system of government shall be so organized that a man or woman born in the republic but shall inherit some means of beginning the world and see before them the certainty of escaping the miseries that under other governments accompany old age, the revolution of France will have an advocate and an ally in the heart of all nations. An army of principles will penetrate where an army of soldiers cannot. It will succeed where diplomatic management would fail. It is neither the Rhine, the Channel, nor the Ocean that can arrest its progress. It will march on the horizon of the world, and it will conquer. <laughs>